Well, good morning, Hope Church. Happy Easter to you. He is risen. He is risen indeed. I wish I was there with you right now. I think we all do. But alas, here we are. Uh, but it's good to join you on this Easter Sunday, however you know we're situated here. It, it's good to be with you. It's good to be in the presence of the Lord this morning. One of the challenges for a pastor uh, is to present a unique and insightful message each year for the major Christian holidays. I'm 33 years old, and many of you have had many more Easter's than I have. Uh, you've been to more Easter services. You've heard the Easter story presented in a number of different ways, from a number of different voices. I know that I've heard some good Easter Sunday sermons. I've been blessed with some kind and wise teachers that helped me to experience the death and resurrection of Christ in ways that helped me to grow in my faith, helped me to know and believe that my sins really are forgiven, and to know and trust Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. The spring of 2009 was a hard season for me. I lost three of the most important voices that I had ever known, three voices that communicated their faith to me, that showed me Christ, not just in what they said, but in what they did. I lost a woman who showed me faith in action with how she lived her life. She didn't worry. She trusted Jesus with everything she had. She also happened to be my grandmother, Lillian Nineman. I lost my most beloved pastor, the man who inspired me to be a pastor. He preached powerfully. He was an expert storyteller and cared deeply for me and the rest of the congregation, a man named Pastor Tom Kyle. And I lost a voice that I had only ever heard crackling through the radio in our kitchen on Saturday mornings, a man named Paul Harvey. Paul Harvey told the same story every year at Easter. And I want to begin this morning by sharing that story with you. If you've never heard it, congratulations, you get to hear a good Easter story. If you've heard it before, reminisce with me as we hear this wonderful telling. Boston preacher Dr. S.D. Gordon placed a beat-up, bent, rusted old birdcage beside his pulpit when he told this story. An unkept, unwashed little lad about ten years old was coming up the alley, swinging his old caved-in birdcage with several tiny birds shivering on the floor of it. The compassionate Dr. Gordon asked the boy where he got the birds. He said that he trapped them. Dr. Gordon asked what he was going to do with them, and the boy said he was going to play with them and have fun with them. The preacher said, sooner or later you'll get tired of them, then what are you going to do with them? The lad said, I have some cats at home. They like birds. I'll feed them to my cats. Dr. Gordon said, Son, how much do you want for the birds? The boy, surprised, hesitated and said, Mister, you don't want these birds. They're just plain old field birds. You, they can't even sing. They're ugly. The preacher said, Just tell me, how much do you want? The grubby little lad thought about it. He squinted up one eye. He calculated and hesitated and said, Two dollars. To his surprise, Dr. Gordon reached into his pocket and handed the boy two one-dollar bills. The preacher took the cage. The boy, in a wink, hurried up the alley. In a sheltered crevice between buildings, Dr. Gordon opened the door of the cage and tapping on the rusty exterior, he encouraged the little birds, one at a time, to find their way out through the narrow door and fly away. Thus, having accounted for the empty cage beside his pulpit, the preacher went on to tell what at first seemed like a separate story, about how once upon a time Jesus and the devil had engaged in a negotiation. Satan had boasted how he'd tap baited a trap in Eden's garden and caught himself a world full of people. What are you going to do with all those people in your cage, Jesus wanted to know. The devil said, I'm, I'm going to play with them, I'm going to tease them. I'm going to make them marry and divorce, and I'm, they're going to fight and kill one another. I'm going to teach them how to throw bombs on one another. I'm going to have fun with them. She said, you can't have fun with them forever. When you get tired of playing with them, then what are you going to do with them? Satan said, I'm going to damn them. They're no good anyway. Damn them. Kill them. Jesus said, how much do you want for them? Satan said, you, you, you can't be serious. If I sell them to you, They'll just spit on you. They'll hate you. They'll hit you. They'll beat you. 
They'll hammer nails into you. They're no good. Jesus said, how much? Satan said, all your tears and all of your blood, that's the price. Jesus took the cage and paid the price and opened the door. That's the Easter story, Hope Church. It's as simple as that. If you ever face a world that questions the goodness of God, well, this is what God did for humanity. He paid our price. He bought us. He paid for our freedom. It's what we do with this story that matters. It defines us. It sets a course for the rest of our lives. Three simple phrases dictate the rest of my entire life, and they find not just their conclusion, but their home at Easter. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. If you believe that, everything else is changed. Everything else finds its place and orientation around that belief. So let's settle in this morning and talk about what Easter means for us. The great story of God's Son coming to earth to live, excuse me, and to die, to set you free, and to bring glory to himself. Would you bow your head in prayer with me as we dig into the word this morning? Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for this Easter story. We thank you, Lord, for the, the meaning and the purpose here at Easter, beyond cute little fluffy chicks and, and Easter eggs and chocolate. God, thank you for this time we have together with our families. Um, help us celebrate more than just those fluffy things. Help us to celebrate, Lord, a, a, a risen Savior who set the cage, set, set, set us free from the cage that we were in. Open the door and let us go free, Lord. You are so good. You let us choose. Even when we spit on you, even when we crucified you, you, you love us. You want the best for us. Pray, Lord, that you would just be with us this morning, that you would meet the needs of these people. Um, Lord, would you meet each one of us where we are? Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you for your word. In your name we pray. Amen. I shared with you on our Good Friday message this week, that the cross of Christ is divisive. It was divisive at Christ's time, it is divisive today. The cross is one of the most recognizable symbols in our world. But it isn't just the cross, but the one who hang up, hung upon it that draws our attention today. I said in our Good Friday message that we have to do something with that cross. We have to do something with Jesus. Malcolm Muggeridge wrote that I would catch a glimpse of the cross and suddenly my heart would stand still. In an instinctive, intuitive way, I understood that something more important, more tumultuous, more passionate, was at issue than our good causes, however noble they might be. I should have worn it. It, the cross, should have been my uniform, my language, and my life. We read the story of the passion of Christ, how his love for people and the nature of who he is as a compassionate and loving God led Christ to the cross. Christ's death was the, first day, was the first day, and then there's this period of waiting, and then finally there is this third day. The third day is a good day. It's the day that God shows up. It's the day that God does something that only God can do. Christ is raised from the dead. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 6, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. This is primary. This is so important. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Christ died, and he was raised from that death. And his raising from the dead doesn't diminish his death or take away from his sacrifice. If you're familiar with the Apostles' Creed, and it's similar really to in the Nicene Creed, you might recognize how Christ is described within its text, how his life is, is, is brought down into just one word. The Apostles' Creed reads about Jesus Christ, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. 
He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. The only word used to describe the life of Christ in the Apostles' Creed is suffered. So central is his suffering for our sake. He did so many other things. He, he taught, he healed, he was tempted, yes, but he suffered for our sake. That is primary. That is what he accomplished. And his resurrection does not take away the pain of his suffering, the price that was paid, that you and I might be set free. What his resurrection does accomplish is to give us hope. Hope is so important, church. We human beings are hopers. We are called Hope Church, after all. Hope is why you get married. Hope is why you have kids. Hope is why you stick with it when the bloom is off the rose. Hope is why farmers plant seeds. It's why people play the stock market. It's why people go on blind dates. It's why people make their pilgrimage every year to Target Field to root on the twins. We're hopers, church. Hope is believing and wanting for a certain circumstance to work out. I hope I get into that school. I hope I get that job. I hope I get the girl. I hope she says yes. We thrive on hope. So what are you hoping for today? When the outcome really matters? I hope she comes back. I hope we don't lose him. I hope it's not cancer. Because one day it will be. One day every worldly thing that you've ever hoped for, one day that will disappear, disappoint, wear out, break down, fall apart. It will, and, and I know, what a, what a positive talk on Easter, right? But when those things happen, like, well, you know, all the... All that we've been counting on and relying on, all the control we feel like we've had that has seemingly fallen away in the midst of a, pande a pandemic. When that happens, then true need is uncovered. There's a stir in the heart, a want, a need to hope for something better, greater, more. I'm actually amazed in Scripture how many times we see the same sort of three-day sort of pattern play out. Because it happens quite a lot, actually, in Scripture. The first day of each story is a dark day. It's the oh-no day. And that first dark day is followed by a day of waiting, the second day. It's almost worse than the first because some things begin to settle in. Dark thoughts steal our hope and make us question what we think we know. And that's followed by a third day, Deliverance Day. Scripture is filled with accounts like this, accounts that connect with us, relate with us, and ultimately point to the cross, the day of waiting and the resurrection. The people of God grew up on those stories, and I think that we need to connect with them. So I want to present some examples to you today of this kind of model of first day, second day, third day, and then at the end we'll come back and circle around to what it has to say about us. First example is in 1 Samuel chapter 5. I'll give you some context here quick. Uh, the Israelites have spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. And they finally get to the promised land, but they're struggling. They don't have a king. They lose thousands of men in a battle. They are really struggling now. They even lose the Ark of the Covenant. <coughs> Excuse me. They lose the Ark of the Covenant to their enemies, the Philistines. <clears throat> the Philistines carried the Ark of the Covenant to a place called Ashdod. And they had a temple there to their god Dagon. And as part of their celebration of beating the Israelites, they bring in the Ark, this symbol, this, this holy thing, this, this god that, that Israel has carried into battle with them, signifies, is, is this amazing object. And they place it right in front of the statue of their god, Dagon. And they spend the night celebrating their victory. And then here's what happened the next morning, 1 Samuel 5, 3-5. through 5. When the Philistines arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set him in his place again. 
But when they arose the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor all who entered Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in the Ashdod to this day. It's a multi-day story. The first day is a dark day for Israel. The Israelites are defeated. The Ark of the Covenant is stolen. When the news got back to Eli the prophet, he dropped dead at the news. His daughter-in-law, who is pregnant, goes into labor and gives birth to a son that in her grief names this new baby boy Ichabod, which means the glory is gone. She is saying, we have no hope. My son might as well know that from the start. The glory is gone. Some of you know all about that kind of day. Some of you have been living in that day. The second day, in, in ways, gets even worse. The enormity of what we've lost, the hope that seems to have betrayed us, is getting real. But what you have to know is that even in the depths of our worst days, there are things going on behind the, behind the scenes, like Dagon bowing down to the Ark of the Covenant in the middle of the night. But the third day is where the whole story takes a 180 degree turn. God afflicts the Philistines of the plague and they move it to another city and then another. And then it's returned to Israel because God came through and God did what only God does. In Genesis 40, Joseph says to the cupbearer who's imprisoned with, In three days Pharaoh will lift up your head and you will be released and restored. The story of Esther who felt that she was in way over her head. She was in placed in a position where she could bring deliverance to her people. She needed to find a way to share a very risky word of truth with a very powerful king. So she fasted and she prayed. Guess how long? On the third day, she went into the presence of the king and spoke a word that if not well received would have cost her her life. But God showed up and made a way for her and the people were delivered on the third day. And then there's Jonah who spent two days in the whale. Just kidding. Three days. Three days in the whale. We don't know how he felt there. He probably felt like death waiting in this whale. But on the third day, God showed up with more compassion and love and kindness and forgiveness than Jonah could ultimately handle. On the day of Christ's crucifixion, it seemed that all had been lost. Christ was hanging there dead. Not just motionless, not just breathless. He was dead. They buried the Savior of the world. It was done. It felt over. The second day was hopeless. If they waited, if anyone, if any one of his disciples had a shred of hope, the waiting did away with it. They returned to their boats. They returned to their livelihoods. They went fishing. They moved on. But on day three, as two women went to mourn at his grave, God did what only God does. He rolled a stone away. He didn't just roll a stone away. He raised his son, Jesus Christ, from the dead. The resurrection restored all hope. It pointed to a glorious future for all those who put their trust in Jesus, that like him we will rise too. That this life is not all. That death does not have the final say. That Jesus Christ was the long-awaited disciple, Messiah, sorry, excuse me, Messiah, who would save his people from their sins. My question for you, church, on this Easter Sunday, is a simple one. What day are you living in? Are you living in the pain of that first day? Are you in disbelief that God would ever die for you? That Christ's death could ever save you? Is your world so dark and alone that you've, you're have you not quite sure what to do? Maybe you've run from him. Like Mark who was so afraid that he ran away leaving his garment behind. Maybe you relate to Peter, denying Christ and his power to save you. Are you living, or are you living in the waiting of the second day? The kind of day where there's just not a lot of hope to cling to. In your life, are you just waiting for God to act? You've heard the story of his sacrifice for you, but you haven't claimed his resurrection for yourself. Or, 
Are you living in that third day? The kind of day where prisoners are set free, where people are restored, mountains shake and waters part. The third day when young harem girls like Esther face down powerful kings and large fish deposit stubborn prophets at seaside ports. The kind of day where stones are rolled away. I want to live in that day. I want his resurrection to change everything about me. Not just what I say. Not just what I think. What I do and who I am. And who I work for. And who I love. And who I praise and who I spend my life on. Would you join me in prayer, church, this Easter Sunday? Heavenly Father, Lord God, I, I thank you that your salvation, that this story of Christ did not end on that night, did not end on the first day, and it didn't end on the second day. As difficult as those days were, as hard as it was for anyone watching, as difficult as that was for your son to endure, it didn't end on those days. And it doesn't even end on the third day. Thank you for the third day. Thank you for the third day when you showed up in big ways. Thank you, God, that, that because of your son now we have hope. We are hopers. And when everything else falls away and control is revealed to be an illusion and we're longing for something more and better and we're limited in our scope and in our view and to us death looks like the end, your son offers us more because of that third day. And now the story continues and what we do with that third day matters. So I pray, Lord, that we would be motivated on days like today Remember your sacrifice, your love, and, and also your resurrection. That we might do something with it. Thank you, Lord, for these people. Thank you, Lord, for Hope Church. Thank you for this, this day where we get to recognize the most important thing. We love you, Lord. We thank you. Amen. I want to pray this benediction over you, and then we're going to close our time together. This benediction is from Psalm chapter 103, verses 8 through 12. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Happy Easter, church. Live and dance and enjoy the freedom he gives. Thank you, Jesus. Love you all. Go in peace.